would you stand up and worship with us today? Every knee will bow. Every 
tongue confess. And I feel like we just need to, just right now in this moment, maybe there's something, you know, a, a big worry that you have in your life. You know, whether it's, you know, a sickness or a financial struggle, maybe it's an issue with one of your kids or, or, or finance or something like that. And I feel like we just need to take a moment here and just remind ourselves that everything will bow to him. Everything bows to him. Every person, every situation, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Come on, church. I said, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Are you full of faith today? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Lord Almighty? Come on, think of that thing right now. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who will know? Everything bows to your name, Jesus. Oh, everything bows to your name. Let it be right here. On earth as in heaven, let it be in our lives. On earth as in heaven, let your glory reign. Let your glory reign, oh hallelujah. Oh hallelujah. Let your glory reign. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord come on sing it out Holy Spirit
touched by your mercy. You are the treasure I find, my reason for living. So let my life become an offering to the one who is worthy.
we surrender today. And I lift my hands up, my whole life down, my whole life down before you. And I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life now is for you. And I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. And I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life now is for you. Come on. And I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. And I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life now is for you. See now, and I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before. here right now right now this is a moment of surrender this is a moment of surrender the spirit of God is saying right now in this room what's it going to be That is where you're strong. That you hold everything together by the word of your power. You hold everything together, Jesus. And so we lay it in your hands. Give you all praise in Jesus' name. Come on, everyone said, Amen. 
Hey, before you see, why don't you turn and greet a neighbor and say, I'm so glad that you are here today. Welcome to church. How many of you are glad you came to church tonight? Well, I'm glad to see you. We have something that's a little different that we've never had at River of Life, and that is that all the people that signed up ahead of time to get baptized are all getting baptized on Sunday and not Saturday. And so uh, with that, though, if you've been at one of our baptism gatherings before, you know that we always leave the opportunity open. Uh, if you walk into this room and you feel like, man, I, I should have signed up, can I just tell you, we have you covered. If you go to the back, into the, into the lobby back there, uh, Tiana is back there and she'd be more than happy to set you up with a change of clothes, with a towel. You can tell your friends and family, they can hop on live and watch. And uh, we would love, love, love the opportunity to do that even before this gathering is done. When we close out in a little bit of worship after I, after I preach for a little bit, um, you will have that opportunity to do that. But before I get into the word, I want to just explain this to you a little bit. Because maybe you're sitting in the room and you're like, well, I don't know if I should get baptized or not. If you've accepted Jesus in your life, if you said yes to him, if you are now saying, I am a follower of Jesus, then what you're saying in getting into this tank is you are saying, who I was is now dead. And who, I'm a, who I am now is alive in Jesus Christ, okay? That I, I, wanna, I, I like to explain this every time because I know that we've got people that are new to the church, people who are, are new to their faith, and sometimes this can get a little bit confusing because we feel like, oh yeah, I should go and have my sins cleansed. This is tap water, folks. It ain't going to do that, okay? It doesn't do that. It's not magic. It came right out of the hose, right? Uh, but it is warm, in case you're wondering. We have it nice and warm for you. Um, but Jesus's blood is the thing that does that, that, that cleanses you of your sin, right? So what you're doing here is you're saying, Hey, I want to make a public declaration. I want my church family. I want my family, I want my friends. I want people to know that something is different inside of me. And so I just want to encourage you if that's you and you've not been baptized in water, Tonight would be a great night to do that, and we would love to do that afterwards. Seth has extra music. If we need it, we'll just keep singing. If, we, if a bunch of you decide to do it tonight, I mean, you know, that would be pretty amazing. Uh, so just be in prayer about that as you're sitting there and we're talking about uh, God's word and, and what God has for you this evening. Uh, at any point, if that's you and you want to make your way back uh, to the lobby, Tiana will walk you through what that looks like to do that. And then uh, she'll even give you a shirt that you'll get to keep that says declaration on it. And so uh, we would love to participate with you in that. Well, I want to look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, and it says this. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. God, tonight, as we look at your word, I pray, Father, that you will show us what we need to see. Father, you are so good, and Lord, you have such great things for us. But Lord, I know that it is super easy for us to get focused on the things that are here on earth. But God, I pray that tonight, this would be just a reminder that we are to set our, our sights higher. That Lord, we are to, to be reminded of the greatness of the God that we serve. And we praise you for that. Lord, I pray no matter where we find ourselves in our, in our spiritual journey tonight, that God, tonight you would, you would draw us closer to you. And we praise you for that and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this goes right along with what we were just talking about a moment ago, but if you've accepted Jesus into your life, you've been raised into a new life. It's not that you have your old life and you now go to church, Right? Some of you, that's what, that's what your faith journey has looked like. You have your same old life, but now you just added something to your calendar for the weekend. And can I tell you, that's, that's bogus. It's not a good way to do it. Because it's not what God says. It's not the way we're supposed to live our life. I believe that many believers have been dug up from the grave, but choose to still live in the cemetery. 
many of you have accepted Jesus into your life. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh. <laughs> mm, I smell. All right. <laughs> Uh, get on it. <laughs> but how true is that? Many believers today have said, hey, I, I've accepted Christ. I've accepted this new life, but I'm kind of comfortable in the cemetery. I'm comfortable around my old friends and my old way of life and, and all the old things. And we don't understand that God is calling us to new. I want life, but I still smell like death. Imagine if when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, if he'd have said, hey, come forth, and Lazarus comes out, and they take the grave clothes off, and, and he's like, oh, God, or Jesus, thank you so much for saving me, and then he goes back into the tomb. He's like, I'm going to get some curtains in here, and we're going to do a little decorating, because I'm actually pretty comfortable in the tomb, right? That would be, that would be ridiculous. But yet many people will come to church on a Saturday or a Sunday and they'll accept Jesus into their life and they'll go right back to the cemetery instead of saying, I'm a new creation and I don't have to go back there anymore. God can even turn a crucifixion into a resurrection and that means he has the power to transform your dead ends into deliverances. Some of you feel as though there's parts of your life that have been dead and gone. There's hope is maybe fleeting inside of your life. Maybe your story is one that's been hard. Maybe you've been somebody that's even been wrapped up in addiction and, and maybe you've even struggled because you've gone from being clean to back into addiction to being clean and back into addiction and you're struggling and, and part of you believes that you'll never fully be recovered. And the reality is, is this. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead can raise your story from the dead. He can bring life where there has only been death. He can bring peace where you've only had turmoil. He can be the one that speaks into your story and everything changes. So I want to talk about that for a few moments today. So how do we move and actually move forward in this thing that we call our faith journey? Well, many Christians leave the grave but they do it begrudgingly. In other words, they, you get saved and you start to follow Jesus. And the thing is, is most of the time when we first accept Christ, we're so excited about this newfound faith that we're like even telling everybody about it. And then as time goes on, what can happen is people begin to crave the grave. They begin to think, oh man, yeah, I'm a believer, so I don't get to go hang out with my friends on Friday night, and I don't get to go, you know, get wasted, and I don't, and all of these things, and we begin to build up the past as though it was something great, when in reality it wasn't. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life, and you may have it to the full. Can I tell you, you can have it, you can have enough, you can have more than enough. But the problem is we stop at half full and then we complain that we're not fulfilled. We stop at half full. What does that mean? It means that we don't live our lives in such a way where we're pressing in and always seeking more. We seek just enough so that we can call ourselves by his name, but not enough so that we're filled with him. It's like if... Uh, we did the, a few weeks back, we did this chili cook-off in here, and, uh, and the winner is sitting in the front row right here. So if I was to say to Al, hey man, that was some really good chili, could you give me the recipe? And so he does, he writes it all down, you know, this many cups of this, this many cups of that, and gives me the recipe, and I pull the recipe out, and I begin to look at it, and I go, oh, it says something in here about beans and about, don't say anything, Richard, um, uh, and, and it says something in here about beef, and it, and, but I, I don't really look at it that close, so I just start throwing stuff into a pot that kind of sounds similar to what Al gave me, and then I try it, and I'm like, man, his chili's not very good. Many of us, that's what we do with this thing. We just kind of glance it over and look at the things and halfway and this and that. And then we go, man, this isn't very fulfilling. 
You got to follow the recipe. You got to trust the book. You got to understand that that in order to have the promises of God, you got to live out the the word of God. But that's how many of us live our lives. God has given you a recipe for success and for fulfillment, but many of us live our lives unfulfilled because we're not actually following the recipe. So how can you be fulfilled? I want to talk quickly about just a few things. The first one is you got to realize that you've been set free from the bondage of sin. Sometimes we, I'll see people who will accept Christ and then they'll go, yeah, now I got to figure out how I'm going to, how I'm going to get through because man, you know, and I get it. There's still, we still are faced with temptation and the enemy, man, he wants to, he wants to knock you down and he wants to drag you through the mud and he wants to keep you in bondage and he wants to keep all these things. But can I tell you that you have been set free and you need to walk in that freedom. You need to understand that, that God already paid the price. He's already taken care of it. Can I, it reminds me of in Numbers chapter 21, the people became irritable and cross as they traveled. This is as the children of Israel are, are, have been led out of Egypt, out of bondage, and now they're, they're making their way to this promise that God has for them. They spoke out against God and Moses. Why did you drag us out of Egypt to die in this God-forsaken country? No decent food, no water. We can't stomach this stuff any longer. So as we look at this story, the children of Israel had been in bondage. They had been slaves. They were in a horrible place. And, and so the story unfolds and God speaks to Moses and Moses goes and, and speaks to Pharaoh and, and a, a lot of things take place. But as it does, then eventually Pharaoh says, okay, the, the children of Israel can go. And so he lets them go. And, and as it unfolds, they, they cross the Red Sea and all of the enemies that were chasing them are, are enveloped. And it's just this amazing, incredible story. But inside of that, now they find themselves out in the wilderness. And what do they do instead of going, hey, let's keep our eyes focused on the promise. They begin to go, man, this is kind of miserable here. At least we had better food when we were in Egypt. They don't remember being whipped. They don't remember, you know, they don't remember all the hard things. They just kind of remember the good. And that's where a lot of us get stuck is that we find ourselves in this place where when we begin to serve God, maybe there's, there's some things that as you walk out your journey with God, he begins to speak to you and say, you need to let those things go. Maybe that's a relationship you shouldn't have anymore or, or that's, a, that's a, a habit that you shouldn't be involved in anymore or whatever. And so you begin to let things go. And then when things get hard, you can easily look back and go, well, before I was saved, at least I had that. But you don't remember the fact that you were actually in bondage. You don't remember the pain and the sorrow that came from living that life. And so the children of Israel were notorious for this. They, they would walk through the wilderness even knowing that God had done the miraculous. Think about that. They, they get out and for them to even be released was miraculous. But then God's doing miracle after miracle after miracle that were very big inside of their lives. But yet still they questioned and for some of you, what you don't understand is that God, when he set you free, when you accepted him into your life, when you said yes to him, he did the biggest miracle of all time, and that is that he took your sin and your shame, and he separated it from you as far as the east is from the west. He didn't have to do that, but he loves you that much that he did. And so when we get to a place where life gets hard, because I will tell you one thing that this book does not promise you is that when you accept Jesus, that now all of a sudden it's going to be roses. It's not. It's hard. And, and so as we walk that out and life gets hard and, and we begin to question, it's in those moments that the children of Israel had a decision to make. They could either look back on the few good things that they used to have or they could continue to look forward and say, I believe in this promise that God has for me. When you look back, you can't move forward as fast as you should. You ever tried like walking and looking back at the same time? Right? I mean, you can do it, and you should be able to do it to some degree, right? But like if you were going to be running, you shouldn't probably be looking backwards while you're running. 
you're going to run into something. You're not going to get there as fast as you can. If I, it, I, I'm not going to be running really fast either way, but if I was going to try and run as fast as I could, I'll tell you where my head would be faced. It would be faced in that direction, right? Because I'm, I'm going to do my best doing that. But many of you, you spend so much time looking backwards that you're not getting where God's calling you as, as he's calling you to move forwards. Many of us choose half full or halfway between bondage and God's promises. Out of the grave, but sleeping in the cemetery. Can I tell you, if you're out of the grave, then sleeping in the cemetery would be cold and miserable. At least when you were dead, you were buried and it would be warm, right? But instead, you're now out of the grave, but you're still sleeping in the cemetery. And you wonder why life seems unfulfilling. Because you're trying to keep one foot in and one foot out. And God's saying, I saved you. I, I, I brought you back to life. You don't need to be in the cemetery anymore. Step two is to change your address. Whenever you move, you've got to make this get online now. You used to have to go to the post office. Now you just get online and you need to tell them, I moved from this address to this address. And then over time, they'll, things will begin to shift and move and they'll get your stuff to you. And then you have to then go to all of the businesses and all the things that you work with. And you need to also tell them that you've changed your address, right? If you don't do that, it's a miserable thing because all of a sudden you're late on bills. You, you forgot that you didn't change the address to and all of these things. But for many of you, you live your life in such a way where as a believer, you say yes to Jesus. You say, yeah, I'm a new creation. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I believe that he came. He died on the cross for my sins so that I can be forgiven of all the nonsense that I've done and all these things. But you don't change your address. And so... All the old things just keep binding you and haunting you. And it's time to say, you know what? That's not who I am anymore. Some of you, I get this because I know how we think. We have our old set of friends and our old things that we used to do. We accept Jesus and now we're excited about our faith journey. But we also don't want to miss out on what's happening. And so we'll oftentimes do this where we'll go, well, I'm going to go hang out with them on Friday night because I'm going to be a witness to them, right? That rarely ever, ever, ever works, right? Because what happens is now you're surrounded with stuff that's your old life. And in those moments, if you would, when you accept Christ and say, hey, I'm a new creation, then when your friends go, hey, we're, gonna, we're going to the bar tonight, or we're going to this party, or we're going to go do this thing, then you, you should be able to say, you know what, I'm a new creation, I'm new, and I, I love you, and I care about you, and if you want to come and hang out with me, that's totally fine, but I'm not going to do any of that stuff anymore. My address has changed. I no longer live in the cemetery anymore. Some Christians live a homeless existence because they're uncomfortable with the cemetery, but they haven't figured out their heavenly address yet. When I uh, moved from, uh, before I was married, um, I, I was living in Missoula. Actually, my dad was pastoring at Christian Life Center. I got offered a youth pastor job in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I moved across the country by myself. And my mom moved me over there, but then I was there by myself. And I, I knew one couple, the pastor and his wife, that was it. And I lived in a city that I didn't know. This was pre-cell phones. <laughs> I know, I'm old. Um, the wheel had just been invented. <laughs> we had this cool thing called fire that we were really all, we, it was all the rage at the time. Um, but so there was no GPS. We had paper maps. Come on. Uh, and so that got me across the country. But when I lived in Green Bay, I didn't know anything. I didn't know where things were. I didn't know. And so, and, and I'll just tell you, if you've never been to Green Bay, Wisconsin, they don't have things that we have here called like mountains <laughs> or even hills. So like if you're in Missoula, you can kind of get a gist by like, oh yeah, the M is on this side. You know, the L is there. And that kind of helps me. But there was none of that. There was just flat. And so I remember trying to live my life and figure out where things were. And I spent a lot of time being lost. 
until I figured out where my home was. There's a lot of times that I'd be like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head home. And, and then it would be like an hour later and there was nothing an hour away from my house in Green Bay. But it would take me a long time to figure it out. And many of you, that's the way that you live your life is that you, your, your, your faith, you have not come to a place where you've said, this is who I am. And so you're always searching, trying to figure it out. But the reality is, is the book tells you who you are. But again, you're only doing the re recipe halfway. And then you're frustrated because it doesn't taste very good. God's word is our GPS. Matthew 22, verse 37. Do that again for me. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. It is our GPS. It is the voice that we are to listen to. It is where we get our guidance and our direction. I remember being on a trip one time and, and I was, uh, I was dry. it was one of the church trips. I can't remember if it was to, the, it might've been to the Dream Center. And I was, all I know is I was driving and I had my phone out and we were trying to get where we were going. And, and I had Google Maps open because we were looking for one thing. And then I had Apple Maps open and we were looking for something else. And, and both of them had different places they were going and I didn't realize that. So while I was driving, it would say, you know, turn to the right up ahead. And then it would say, stay straight ahead. And it took me a little while to realize that I had two different voices telling me two different places. And it was very frustrating. That's how many of you live your life. Yes. You've got multiple voices giving you multiple directions. And until you figure out what voice you're going to listen to, life is going to be very hard. Amen. You're going to end up getting nowhere fast. Right. First Corinthians chapter 15. Don't fool yourselves. Bad friends will destroy you. Amen. Be sensible and stop sinning. You should be embarrassed that some people still don't know about God. Many of you have allowed your friends to be in a position that they should not be in. You've allowed relationships in your life to be the thing that is louder than God's word. You've allowed, you've allowed people who don't necessarily have your best interest at heart to have this very strong position inside of your life. And it's time to shut down some voices and start putting your hope and your trust in who God says that you are. Because I'm going to let you in on a little secret. God always has your best interest at heart. Yeah, he God always wants the best for you. Yes, he does. And so even sometimes he'll walk us through something that's hard, but it, it's not because he's angry or because he wants to hurt you. It's because he wants to bring you somewhere. Yeah. He always has somewhere that he wants to bring you to. Step three is know what home looks like, not just how to get there. What is the goal? Can I tell you, many of you walk through life with no direction, much, much like many churches do these days. It's very easy for the church to just sleepwalk. And that's not what God's calling us to. Disobedience and not trusting God will lead us on a journey that God never intended us to be on. Can I tell you, the children of Israel, it's interesting because if you follow that story, you know that God brings them out of Egypt and he says, I have this promised land for you. But because they kept not listening, it took them 40 years when it should not have taken them anywhere near that. I, I pulled this map up. I think they've got it to put up on the thing. I wanted you to see this because it gives you a little bit of, of perspective. Where they started is here. Where they needed to end was there. 
And look at the route that they took. I don't know how many of you can see that in the back, but there's a red line that is going every which way. There's a U-turn that happens there. There's all kinds of stuff. Why? Because they were choosing to not listen. Some of you, that's your, that's your faith journey right there. You're all over the place. And then you're wondering, God, why is it that it's so hard? It, why is my faith, why is it, why, this should just be easy. And the reality is, is God saying, listen to me. Listen to me, because what I have for you is good. And even though you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you won't have to fear because you know that he's with you and you know that he's bringing you somewhere. The problem is, is for many of us, what happens is we put ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death because we're not listening to him. Listen to our main verse that we started with again, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Our vision needs to be elevated. We need to realize that, that as, as hard as life is and as much of a struggle as it is, I, I was just having a conversation with, with somebody before church about just like there's a lot of hard stuff going on in the world right now. And it's super easy to keep my eyes on this plane. But I, 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 I can't live here. I need to elevate my vision. I need to lift my eyes. I need to realize that, that uh, like, again, even just close your eyes with me for just a moment and, and visualize with me that scene where, where God the Father and Jesus is sitting and they are fully in control some of you, your world feels completely out of control right now. But just take a moment and, and lift your eyes and, and, and visualize the God of the universe who is fully in control and Jesus and they love you and they care for you and they have plans for you and dreams for you and there's nothing in this world that invokes fear inside of them. If Jesus is our example, Jesus' life was dominated by his conviction, the will of his Father. To know his will, we must know him. And to know him, we must make him a priority. Can I tell you that in this time and in our lives, I know that there are a lot of things that push for your time and your attention. But if your home is not here, then your priority needs to be what he says is your priority. Oh, Listen to what Jesus says, John chapter 4, verse 34. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus doesn't say my hobby is, my to-do list is. He says my food is. What does that mean? It means the thing that sustains him. The, things that, the thing that keeps him alive is to do God's will. Yeah. A living church must find God's will and make it the number one priority. Amen. We must burn with the conviction that the kingdom of God is the greatest cause in the world. See, the thing is, is when we do that, it actually is what will bring fulfillment to us. We often look for things that are comfortable, thinking that will make us feel fulfilled. But that's not how God designed us. God didn't design us to chase comfort. He, he designed us to chase him, to chase his will, to chase what, he's, what his priorities are. And so it's in that when we come to that place of saying, yes, I'm going to pursue you with all that I am. But some of, some of us have chosen that we are going to live with, we're halfway in and halfway out. And I'm just telling you that God is calling us to remove the grave clothes, to step out of the cemetery and to begin to live a new life. Yeah. I'm going to have the worship team come and they're going to get ready to lead us in a little bit more worship. And as we do, I just, I really feel like in these, in these closing moments today, for some of you, this has been a moment of, of being reminded You've tried to live with one foot in and one foot out, and I'm just telling you right now, that is the most exhausting life that you could ever live. Because it's not how he designed you. 
He wants you to live with the fulfillment of who he says that you are. He wants you to know the whole recipe so you can have what tastes good. But that's your choice. He's a, he's a gentle and a, and a beautiful God and he doesn't force us to do anything. But he shows us. And when we are obedient and when we walk that out, we find what we're looking for, which is to be fulfilled. So if you're in, the, in this place today and you have accepted Jesus into your life, this is that moment where you say, you know what, God, I'm tired of still living in the cemetery. Some of you, you have relationships you need to cut out and you know it. Some of you have habits that you need to let go of and you need to say, God, I'm trusting you to help me to be who you're, you're asking me to be. For some of you, you, you need to take a moment and say, God, I need to chase your will instead of my will. I need to make your will the thing that sustains me. And again, if you're in this place today and you'd say, yeah, I've accepted Christ, but I, I'd, I need to make a public declaration of that. We will, we will wait if you still want to do that. Maybe that's the message you needed to hear so that you'd realize, man, I, I need to be dead to myself. And I need to, I need to show that I'm now alive in Christ. So I'm gonna pray over you wherever you find yourself today. Can I just ask you for these closing moments together? Can you just press in? Can you just say, God, will you do surgery inside of my life? Whatever it is inside of me that needs to be tweaked and changed, I'm handing it to you and I'm trusting you with it. God, we're so grateful. Lord, you have raised us to life. You've called us out of darkness and into the light. So Lord, I pray that you will help us to actually start walking that out. Lord, I pray for those who have accepted you into their life but have set up a tent in the graveyard. What a miserable existence that is. Lord, I pray that today would be a day where you'd point out what it is that they need to do to trust you more. God, for those who have made a half-baked recipe, just reading portions of your word and not really understanding why they feel so unfulfilled. I pray, God, that in this moment right now, as you do surgery inside of their life, that you'd speak to those places in their heart and they would fall in love with you deeply, passionately. God, we praise you for all that you do. We rest this in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand as we worship together?
Take this heart and breathe on it. This heart that is now yours. You can have it all, Lord. Every 
part of my world. I take this life and breathe on this heart that is now.
part of my world. Take this life and breathe, Lord. This heart that is now yours. Every part of my world, I take this life and breathe, Lord, this heart that is now yours. Let's sing it again. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my Take this life and breathe, Lord, this heart that is now yours. Jesus, we just we glorify you today. to thee. 